started. The adverse drug events is the topic that we'll be discussing today. Next slide. But first, a couple of introductions. Um, this slide, we wanted to let you know that as we've been sending out um, surveys to our hospitals and we've been spending a lot of time talking to you, we want you to know that we hear you, that we're listening to what you have to say and we're trying to take your suggestions and implement them into our um, program. So just as a couple of things, um, a lot of people on our survey have requested more communication from us, from the Intermountain Lead Hen and the subject matter experts. Um, so we've implemented an electronic newsletter. The second, um, the second edition of that newsletter went out last week. And if you haven't seen it, send us an email at admin at henlearner.org and we're happy to forward it to you. Um, if you did receive it, feel free to forward that to people who might be interested in it. Um, we, we find it to be a good way to let you know what's going on and hopefully shed a little more light on some of the specific things that are happening at individual hospitals and systems. Um, the other thing that we've implemented fairly recently is you've asked for a place to continue the discussion for the webinars and we've set up in affinity group calls. We've had, um, I don't know the number off the top of my head, but between seven and eight affinity group calls on various topics and they've we found them to be a great place to continue the discussion that started on the webinar, to share ideas, to answer questions, to basically it's a place for open communication about the subject um, at hand. They're hosted by our subject matter experts that are on the, on the actual webinars themselves and um, we think they're a great way to, to share across our hospitals and we hope you do too. Okay, please. Um, so the affinity group calls that are coming up um, we've got actually quite a few this week. Tomorrow we have our readmissions call and we ask you if you have a subject or a topic you'd like to discuss around readmission, send us an email at admin at henlearner.org. Let us know what that is. We have Andy Massica from Baylor who will be hosting that call and it's a fantastic place to open that discussion. It's not too late to send questions, so go ahead and shoot those over to us. On September 13th, and I'll talk a little more about this in just a minute, we have a human factors call. On September 14th, we have patient falls and immobility. The 19th is early elective delivery. I'm missing a Y on that, my apologies. And on the 25th, we have pressure injuries. Next slide, please. The human factors affinity call I want to draw your attention to today. If you attended our in-person meeting in May, you met Dr. Frank Drews, who um, is an expert in human factors and is um, very interested in helping you out with ways that human factors can influence your implementation of some of our ideas at your hospital. He will be um, hosting a one-hour call. The first one, again, is the 13th, so this Thursday. If you have concerns or questions or suggestions, please shoot us an email and let us know what you want Dr. Drews to talk about. We have a few things in mind, but we're happy to answer questions. Um, the information, the call-in information on that is located on our website at henlearner.org in the calendar section. And we want to let you know that we're here to help you. If there's technical assistance you need, if you have questions, if you have requests or comments, please send us an email. We monitor admin at henlearner.org closely. And you can find on henlearner.org um, the resources, calendar of events, and archived materials. All right. At this time, A, I want to check and make sure we have Marlon Conti on the line. Marlon, are you there? I'm here. Can you hear me? Great. Yes, we can. Um, I'm going to turn the time over to Marlene and let her open up this webinar, and she'll, I'll let her introduce her co-presenters as well. Marlene? Okay. Thank you very much. Is Scott in the room with you? He is. Okay. Awesome. So this is Marlene Conti with Intermountain, and I work in the Quality Department. Um, next slide, please in the central office and my role is patient safety coordinator so I have lots of patient safety teams and the medication safety team is one of those. I co-chair that with Beth Johnson who's the pharmacy manager so she and I are joined at the hip <laughs> for lots of stuff. And then Scott Evans is a medical informaticist we've worked with uh, over many years for lots of distant projects and he's going to be doing some of the content today for our webinar. Next slide. Okay, at the conclusion then of today's discussion, you should be able to identify some key components of an effective adverse drug event prevention program for your facilities and organizations. You should be able to pick out at least two possible interventions that you could work on and implement at your facility. 
and then be prepared to begin submitting your measures of success. Next slide, please. This is a slide from some of the CMS uh, National Content Developer information, but it really is part of the basic CMS um, call for the contract initially. And you can see that adverse drug events is the number one hospital-acquired condition, followed by pressure ulcers as number two, catheter-associated UTIs, number three, et cetera. So lots of big reasons to be looking at hospital-acquired conditions. And this as a rate per 100,000 discharges, and this is the Medicare data, um, is 49. So you can see it's a very important reason or important um, priority for all of our systems. Next slide. <clears throat> so the outline for our discussion today is we're going to talk about things that you will need to do if you've not done them already to get started on an adverse drug event prevention program and then share some things that we've been doing at Intermountain that we call working harder, and then some additional things that are sort of ahead of the curve or on the leading edge, and that's where Scott Evans will be joining us mostly as well for the discussion. And lastly, we'll discuss some of the measures that we're recommending we collect for all of the uh, participating hospitals. Next slide. So getting started, uh, we just recently last month got some preferred areas of focus from CMMI in one of their um, contractors' conferences, and they're asking that as people work on adverse drug events uh, reduction that they prioritize some of these areas. So anticoagulant safety, glycemic agents, med-related readmissions, opioid safety, and BTE prophylaxis. We'll touch on many of these um, as we discuss our content today. Next slide. Okay, so for getting started, um, at Intermountain in any organization, medication safety and reduction of adverse drug events needs to be an organizational priority. And what I mean by that is there's top-down leadership involvement, multidisciplinary involvement. You've got administration, nursing leaders, medical staff, pharmacy, nursing, um, and all other departments that are applicable involved in the process. And that it's on the top of their list rather than the bottom of their list that you develop and have in place monitoring system for adverse drug events and other process indicators related to med safety. And that you have a designated team. For Intermountain, we have a system medication safety team that crosses the 22 hospitals, um, our medical group and our home care division. And that group meets every other month. And they have representatives from the divisions and the regions and disciplines. And that at the facility levels, facilities or regions, and Intermountain is divided into regions as well, that there be an interdisciplinary team identified whose responsibility or accountability is for medication safety. And in some instances, that includes the Pharmacy and Therapeutics Committee. In some places, it's a specific patient safety committee or a specific medication safety committee. We don't mandate the committee that has that accountability. We just ask that they have an identified team or committee that has the accountability for medication safety. <clears throat> and that means they review policies and processes, procedures, guidelines, and that they look at all the adverse drug events and monitor that and try and implement processes for performance improvement. And that all of those teams and committees then have a rigorous um, performance improvement process, be it Plan Do Study Act or um, any of the other um, processes that are used for performance improvement. Next slide. So more getting started. These are just some resources, and many of you who are involved in patient safety already know about these. These are some links, and we will make sure that these links are on the Ham Learner website as well. So there's IHI trigger tool for measuring adverse drug events, and that really is focused on medication reconciliation. The IHAI Match Medication Reconciliation Toolkit, which is an updated document, ISMP, um, ISMP High Alert, uh, and the NCC MERPS, the National Coordinating Council for Medication Error Prevention. There are lots of others out there as well, um, references, but this is a good core place to start. Next slide. So at Intermountain, what we've done is we've just put together sort of an accountability diagram that describes from the central office perspective who our team reports to. And we report directly to a group called the Patient Safety Key Process Team that reports to a group called COLT. COLT is the Clinical Operations Leadership Team, and it has vice president level folks from across the system, um, and uh, both nursing, medical, and administration. 
our med safety team reports to pharmacy and therapeutics for policies and procedures and guidelines, and if we have issues that we need a lot of medical staff input and support for. And then I sit on the Nursing Practice Council, and Beth Johnson also goes to the Nursing Practice Council, and the Practice Council does nursing protocols, uh, standards, procedures, and we work with the Practice Council, which also represents all of the region's facilities and clinical programs. As a med safety team, um, we have a lot of other teams at the central office that we've asked to communicate and report to us, and so you'll see some of those along the bottom. So there's a medi medication event verification work group, and that's a group of pharmacists who manage, who review all medication errors and, and uh, put data into our event system around what type of error, what classification of harm, et cetera. We have a team that specifically works on barcoding for med administration. And that's led by a nursing manager and an informatics uh, person. We have the pharmacy directors group, which is what it looks like. It's all the pharmacy directors from the system, and that's led by our central office pharmacy services director. And we have some other teams. The anticoagulation task force was formed a few years ago when Joint Commission launched the NPSG related to anticoagulation safety. That is led by a physician, co-led by a physician and another pharmacy director. The Sigma Pump is our large volume pump team. Um, that is led by a nursing director and a pharmacy manager at the central office level. And there's a pain management um, process, and that's set up similar to clinical programs. That's led by a nurse clinician and a physician, and then anesthesiologist as the pain physician. Fusion Services is another team that is also led by a nursing services representative and has pharmacy participation. And then a glucose management team that works on obviously insulin related um, sorts of issues and processes as well. So these are teams that work with us as a med safety team and any and all of those teams have the same level of participation that we talked about before in terms of regional or facility and clinical programs. So we've got a broad distribution sector. Next slide. So underneath that, um, our, key, our medication safety team has done some strategic planning this year. We've identified what we call key processes that the med safety team then has oversight for. So on the right-hand side, we have uh, a whole set of policies and procedures and things we've been working on, um, revising and fine-tuning and updating. We have the reconciliation process, both the procedures, the forms, and the discharge orders, which is an application a database application. And then we have obviously storage, uh, which is part, falls under med management, uh, drug shortage issues, and we have a whole robust process for that. We have a system team of antibiotic stewardship. That group reports through pharmacy and therapeutics and um, back up through the infection control guidance group. On the left-hand side, we have some other processes that we're working on, all kinds of pumps, large volume, syringe, and the CAD pumps, et cetera. Aid management is where the CAD pumps go. Um, ADE monitoring, Center Mountain has a robust system for monitoring um, both adverse drug events, errors, reactions, and some process indicators as well around barcoding utilization. And then we try and focus on obviously high risk drugs, insulin, heparin, um, anticoagulants, some other things as well that are on that list. So these are just sort of visual of the things that the med safety team tries to make sure we're looking at monitoring, managing, and working on performance improvement for. Next slide. Well, some of the things that we do for monitoring is that we have an accurate, what we believe is a fairly accurate event reporting system, a very robust reporting system, and we've got some graphics later in the presentation we'll show you that demonstrate um, the good reporting that we have. It is still, in most instances, um, voluntary reporting. We do, however, have the adverse drug event trigger system that helps us do more concurrent monitoring, and that also feeds into the event reporting system. This event reporting system is managed by the Risk Management Department. It's a system-wide database that is available through our web, and it's available in all clinical settings to all employees. Um, other things we do then are identify concurrent monitoring systems such as pump formulary usage, usage of trigger tools, usage of barcoding. We've been monitoring whether or not there's an override of the barcode for the medication or the patient or other things and working on performance improvement there. 
So as a system, then, if they're web accessible, we have a data warehouse that we put the data into that we can use for query and analysis. And it gives us the ability to roll up to the system level or down to a region level, facility level, department level, or a specific drug um, if we want to focus on a specific uh, medication. So it's a fairly robust system. It's been in place a long time, and we can do a lot with it. Next slide. So our, the ADE definition, this is Intermountain's definition, is fairly consistent with what you'll see in the literature, but it includes all errors and reactions. And anything involving a medication that causes or could lead to patient harm while the medication is in the control of the, of the system. So if the patient takes the wrong medication while they're at home and not under our control, it's not considered a medication error. It might be a readmission, and then we would monitor it from a readmission perspective, but it wouldn't be an ADE. Next slide. So this is just an example of one of the reports that we have for the system uh, to give us the roll up and the drill down. The top, and this is web accessible, you can choose a region, a facility, or the system level, and then you can get a graphic. This one's just a run chart, and then you, it can get drilled down to numbers and um, more data underneath that. So what you'll see here, the top line is all ADE, so that's all errors and reactions. And the very bottom line is, that's the yellow one, which is almost zero most of the time, is the severe adverse drug event. Next slide. We use the NCC MERP index for categorizing medication errors for Intermountain Healthcare, and we implemented that in 2006, I believe for all of our ADEs. And what a process is, is a staff member reports the error or reaction that gets entered into the event database. It goes to a pharmacist who does a verification of that ADE and then classifies it on the A2I categories, as well as does some further classifications in terms of whether or not it was an ordering error or an administration error or um, transcription error. There's some subsets that we have underneath that. Next slide. I'm going to let Beth talk to you for a few minutes then about what we're doing in terms of um, electronic medication reconciliation. And we don't have the perfect system, but we do have pieces and parts. She understands it well. What we discovered when we started trying to work with medication reconciliation is we really needed a process that we could track and, and keep with the patient because some of our patients do return for care. And we do have. Um, a pharmacy system that does allow us to build within it some structure. And so we started working with our IS folks to build medication reconciliation within our pharmacy IS system. And basically what we do right now, our current process is that we have a paper form that is used to collect the medication history. And the nurses oftentimes are the ones that predominantly co collect the history. Then the pharmacy staff will take that history that's been collected by the nurse and they will go through it and verify it to make sure that it's accurate. And that, that particular portion of medication reconciliation process takes a bit of time if the patient's med history is long. We do spend time calling pharmacies to verify doses and drugs sometimes. And once we feel like that the history really is as accurate as we can get it, then we take that piece of paper that we've used to collect information, we enter it into our information, our electronic information system. That produces a, a medication history that then is, is part of the patient's record. If they're readmitted, then we have a, at least have a start and we go in and just make adjustments based on things that may have happened in between their stays. But once we get it into the medication history uh, portion of our system, we can then print it out as a admission order where the physician can go through and select the medications that the patient is on at home and, and make it into either an order for the drug or they will not order it based on the patient's uh, clinical status. And then the pharmacy then can take the actual admission order and that's where the verification and the reconciliation actually takes place. Once the doctor goes through and verifies everything that he would like to order, the pharmacist does their second check to enter the orders as um, admission orders, 
And if there are any questions about why this physician chose to either omit a drug or, or um, add additional drugs, then, then we have our chance then to actually talk with the doctor and, and verify that that's exactly what they wanted. But it makes it a kind of clean process when we can print out that order set based on the home meds, and they can go ahead and check yes, continue, or do not continue, and they can put the reason why. And it helps us with the reconciliation process. If it makes sense to the pharmacist, they go ahead and enter the order. Um, then we also have very similar process if the patient's transferred. For instance, if they're admitted to the ICU and a couple of days, days later they're, they're transferred out to the floor, we then can print out a transfer order sheet, which go, yeah, ahead, go, ahead, slide. go ahead and switch slides. So the transfer order sheet can be generated where the doctor then has the same opportunity to once again look at the home medication list and the drugs that they've been currently receiving while in the ICU and select which drugs they would like them to continue when they're transferred out onto the floor. Pharmacists then can validate and reconcile that list and make sure that, that it is indeed makes sense clinically. Then they go ahead and enter that transfer order. And we follow the same process at discharge. We do have uh, right now a kind of a duplicate process for discharge. And one of the systems that we have is, is a, a little bit more robust in making a complete discharge order. So we have a lot of our physicians um, trained to use this discharge orders tool, which allows them to actually put all of the discharge orders into one document for the patient. And Within that document, we've been able to work with IS to transfer all that home medication history into the discharge order so that they can go ahead and select which medications they would like to, to, con to continue at home. And then it, it actually will print prescriptions and it will print a list for the patient that they can use to take to the next provider. If the doctor has not been trained or doesn't want to use this complete tool for discharge, we do have built within the pharmacy system the discharge order where they can go ahead and select the medications for discharge based on the home med and the medications that they were currently receiving. And it does also provide a list for the patient that they can use to take to their next provider. Go ahead and change slides, please. Another thing that's built within our pharmacy system, which I'm sure most of you have in yours as well, are, are allergy uh, modules where you can make sure that patients don't receive medications that they're allergic to. So when the patient notes on their medication history form that they have a drug allergy, the pharmacist also uses that and goes into this allergy module and puts the drug allergy that the patient has. They enter it into the system, and this is a screenshot of what that looks like to the pharmacist. They enter the medication history. And go ahead and change slides, please. And then if by some chance another pharmacist comes behind them and is entering a medication that is a stated allergy, they'll try to process the medication. And in this situation, we use the example of a sulfa allergy. The, the pharmacist is entering a drug that would, would uh, be an allergy to the patient. Next slide, please. When they go to try to enter it, they get this warning screen that says, wait a minute, the patient's allergic to this. You better not enter it, and you need to go figure out what to do. So this is a, is a place where they can either say, okay, I need to go talk to the doctor, or they understand, they've already understand what the issues are, what the allergy was, and there's been a decision to go ahead and give the medication. They actually have to validate that they want to go forward, and so it's recorded who, who does what. So that's a way that we try hard to make sure that patients don't get medications that they're allergic to, and it really brings home the fact that in all of your areas that you can possibly get it, pharmacist first review of every order before it's administered is really important so that the allergy piece is covered. Well, sometimes we have found in our system, in areas where we don't have pharmacist first review, sometimes the allergy piece is missed and they'll go ahead and a nurse may not even understand that the drug that they're giving contains the product that that the patient's allergic to and they will administer it. This system allows us to actually electronically note that we know there's an allergy and it, cross, it cross-references all the drugs against that allergy. Next slide, please. 
Another area that we've really worked hard in pharmacy with nursing is to improve the utilization of our smart pump technology. One of the things we found we really needed to do was be able to produce reports out of our pumps that that would make sense to nursing leadership where they could see what our compliance was in, in using the pumps appropriately. And so we developed a report structure here at the corporate office at Intermountain Healthcare where we can pull in all of the data from our smart pumps and start to look at, the, at utilization. One of the things we first focused on was what, what is called basic mode, where the nurse is not choosing a drug that's in the library. They're, they're just using putting in their own parameters. And our, our policy actually states that if it's in the library, you, you have to use the smart pump library to, to, use, to infuse the drug. So we were able to show that there was quite a high utilization of basic mode through this report structure that we developed. We shared that with nursing leadership. With them, we created a common goal, and then we decided we needed to establish an education plan, which was in of, its, of itself an education process as we looked at the types of documents that were out there that nurses were using to ed be educated for on our pump. And we found some issues within those documents. We were able to get those fixed. And uh, now we have gone through and re-educated all of our nursing. And go ahead to the next slide, please. And follows kind of this smart pump management process that we have here, where we, we look at the pump ca capacities and capabilities. Then we look at what our policies and procedures are. How can we support it through the system? We go through the nurse practice group, through um, our IS folks, and then look at the drug information. We're just going to continue to cycle with all of our different issues that we find with the pump. And we are finding some great success with being able to change practice and drive a safe practice for infusions. Go ahead to the next slide, please. So you can see that right here we have um, a, a barcode chart that shows you how many times we actually were able to update our smart pump. And what happened in these few years right here, where you can see the first year that we have on the barcode is the year that we got the smart pumps in place, basically. And we had one update to our library, and it affected 23 drugs. And then in 2010, we also did one update, and it only affected 15 drugs. But in 2011, at the end of 2011, we actually resourced a, a specific FTE to the pumps. And so from 2011 till current 2012, we've actually done seven updates to our libraries. And in the 2012, we fixed 52 drugs within the library. And a lot of that had to do with resourcing and making sure that we had a, an FTE that was specific to our pumps. And that's also another reason why we're able to work through these issues with nursing. Next slide, please. And this is a graph of how we were able to impact the utilization of the basic mode by doing the education and having those reports available to leadership where they saw something they could actually address and monitor it and, and set a goal. Next slide, please. Okay, so this is Marlene again. I just want to talk a little bit about some of the basic things we have in place for education. And again, this is part of the getting started process. Ensuring that you have appropriate new employee orientation for the clinical settings and for the patient, the employee's job description. So that the ICU nurse gets something a little different than the pediatric nurse. And then there's different education that goes to pharmacists across the system, both based on the scope of services for the areas they're assigned and their clinical specialties. Um, we also have a nurse residency program at Intermountain Healthcare that lasts about nine months. And those individuals, new nursing staff, are assigned to a mentor. They have special classes where they do a lot of skills pass off and testing um, so that it helps build their critical thinking skills and dem gives us a better demonstration of competency. Uh, medication competency and med tests have been developed for all clinical settings and clinical programs, and those are administered by the education directors and coordinators at the facilities. And then for all the things that are uh, all the different pumps, hazardous drugs, high-risk medications, we have separate computer-based training modules and, in many cases, skill pass-offs where they have to see one, do one, 
uh, somebody passes them off for each of the different types of pumps, et cetera. And then we have annual reviews and reminders and annual skill days in the facilities. And in the quality department, we have an annual fourth quarter patient safety update where we review all the national patient safety goals and any significant patient safety uh, initiatives at Intermountain. Next slide. Other med safety initiatives, Beth's already talked to you about some of the stuff we've done with IV pumps, um, formulary standardization and monitoring. We've spent a lot of time working on reducing um, override rates uh, on our barcoding processes as we brought the facilities along and got, made sure that we've got um, better equipment in terms of the scanners and the labels and also the software and the IT pieces. And I've got a graph in a minute, we'll show you that. And then uh, obviously any coagulation as it was a national patient safety goal in 06, 07 and implemented in 08 and a lot of work done there. The ADE trigger system, which Scott will talk about in a minute. And then um, the CAD pump stuff. So we have our pump manager at the pharmacy level, a system level who's the pharmacist. And then we have a special pain management team that works with the, the CAD pumps as well. Next slide. So these are some of the things under working harder. This is just an example of one of the reports that we can get for the system where we break out the data by numbers of doses. And this is something we worked on for a number of years. So this is doses charged. Hopefully the doses charged reflects doses given. Um, but it's the, the denominator that we use for we've always had, you know, good robust data coming from our adverse drug event reporting system, and we calculated rates based on a 1,000 patient days, and that's been our standard. It's standard across the nation and a lot of other areas. But the better data comes from the ability to look at rates per dose. So now we have the ability to look at rates per dose by specific medication, whether or not it was an adverse drug event or an adverse drug reaction. Um, so we have uh, about four fifth column over there's an ADR rate, a number of errors. For, and then we ask the pharmacist, this piece of pharmacy does, was this error considered preventable? Um, and was it, which one of the A through I categories did this um, ADE fall under the full A through I? So A meaning it did not reach the patient, I meaning we had significant harm to the patient. This report can be done for any time period you want, for the system level, for the region level, the hospital level, or department level, or it can be done by the specific drug. So on the left-hand side, if you click on the individual drugs, then you get the detail for those specific events that describe exactly what happened, and you can track it back to the units and have some performance improvement go on there. Next slide. Um, this is demonstration of some of the stuff we've done with barcode med administrations. We've been working on that for a number of years, and as we said earlier, we have 22 hospitals. So this is just a, a one example of the impact it made at one facility. It's a 76 bed hospital, and we were just this is just raw numbers of ADEs before barcode med administration was implemented and after. So prior to the new BCMA, they were averaging 63 events per quarter. After BCMA, they're averaging 30, 29.6. Next slide. This is a similar example at a larger facility. And the before and after, again, dramatic decrease. So before, they were averaging 257 events per quarter. After BCMA, they're averaging 132 events per quarter. This is not a rate. These are just raw numbers. It was just a way for us to sort of look at it from the barcode med and med team's perspective to see what the direct impact was. Next slide. Um, and then we have an improvement process. We talk about the different teams, med safety teams, and the other teams that work with us. And what we've asked is both at the central office level and the region and the facility level that they talk about how they've got their reports going, they have they share the information with nursing leadership, that we work jointly to create common goals, and that we establish um, interactive and multidisciplinary education plans. Next slide. So the barcode med admin stuff, this is a visual. We had a joint goal in 2010 between nursing and pharmacy to reduce the barcode overrides. This is per doses administered. The override rate went down from 4.3 to 1. 
um, over that time frame, and, and we're writing at about 0.7 right now, so we continue to work on that. And most of those overrides end up being, well, the medication wasn't in the system yet, or they couldn't read the scanner wasn't working, or the patient's badge was a name band, um, the ID band wasn't readable. There's a bunch of other little issues that we continue to work on, but we really want to drive that as close to zero as we can get. Next slide. Um, this is a visual that shows you what we've been trying to do is keep our reporting rate high so we can work on performance improvement to reduce the injury rate. So the um, y-axis on the left-hand side of the screen is the total ADEs, and that's the green line. The y-axis on the right-hand side of the screen is the events with harm, again, using the A through I categories, and those that implement, that caused harm that required some level of treatment for the patient. And you can see dramatic improvement as we've worked on lots of processes with barcoding and pumps and order sets and standardization of protocols, et cetera, to continue to drive that down. And we're continuing to work on it. Next slide. Um, these are just some of the cycles of improvement, and this is a um, sequence process control chart. So you can see the blue line is the rate. The red little red dotted lines are upper and lower control limits, and just some of the things that we've done. So we started BCMA. We got it implemented at all the hospitals in 2010 and all of the inpatient units. Um, we've been playing around with the AD trigger tool, which Scott will talk to you about here in a minute. And you can see successive levels of improvement. <laughs> Next slide. Patient family education, um, these are all around drug-specific information. We have a, a drug education formulary or archive online that nurses can use, and many of our clinical programs have additional education tools that they've developed. Anticoagulation, diabetic education, just a part failure. These are some examples. Just hit the return button. There's some little images that will pop up there, Jason. Thank you. So this fact sheet is committed diet. Next one, Skinner, and this is the anticoagulation injections and mods. The self management is the congestive heart failure one. Um, okay, Scott, this is you. If you're in the room, you get to take over for the trigger tool. Okay, morning. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Okay, good. So back in 1989, we found out that out of 25,000 patients at LDS us, that we only had eight or eight to ten adverse drug events. Um, so that's what was reported. But in reality here, um, we realized that we were not picking them all up. So that's when we needed, we decided to uh, create, as Marlene has uh, talked about, the adverse drug event trigger tool. Now this was a computerized program. We also developed first of all what we called the ED reporting program and that replaced the uh, manual uh, incident report. So uh, nurses, pharmacists, doctors could uh, go in there and report uh, to the EMR, electronic medical record, whether they thought a uh, patient was having an ED or not. So anytime that gets entered in there, the computer is uh, constantly monitored uh, actually entered in there. The computer also constantly monitors all lab data that gets entered in, in uh, to the EMR. Drug uh, doses, anything that might indicate a uh, drug was ordered to uh, treat an ADE. Drug levels, vancomycin, peaks, troughs, cycles, boron, and also change in uh, vitals that may indicate that a uh, patient's having a possible ADE. So for example, the trigger tool, now a lot of the triggers are not, an, uh, that's not a new thing uh, as of uh, the last number of years. A a HI has taken our uh, triggers, added to those, but these were the ones that we developed that could be based out of our uh, EMR. Some of them are fairly easy, uh, some of them are uh, quite complicated. For example, if a patient has a doubling in creatinine. That would generate an alert, but we also try to reduce the number of false positives. So we check to see whether this is a renal transplant patient or the patient is, has a renal uh, failure or not. Some of them get a little bit more complicated, potassium less than 3.0 and decrease of 0.8 or uh, potassium less than 
six with a decrease of 0 0.5 within 72 hours. And the patient's either on a potassium re reducer or, the pa or on a potassium uh, riser, and it was discontinued within the last five days. Um, it can be fairly easy, cycles four and greater than 100. Black zone, and the, pre and the patients on previous are, are cotics, and the patient's not a uh, gastric bypass. Just all like the uh, blood pressure less than 80, and it decreased by uh, 20 within 48 hours, and the patient's also on a hypotensive drug. So as human factors and workflow goes, we have uh, changed things over the last number of years. Previously, we began with just having a pharmacist, a hospital pharmacist, would get a printout every day. Uh, the printout would take the patients, order the patients by the top floor of the hospital. He would then take the elevator up and then work through and do all that. That's uh, worked for some places over the last number of years. We've also made it so the pharmacist can uh, go in and manually say, just give me all the possible adverse drug events for the patient of my division. It was felt that those uh, pharmacists would better know their own uh, patients. So uh, we currently do each of those. Another thing that we're doing now, we're testing uh, so that the pharmacists don't have to remember to uh, run the trigger tool. Uh, the program now uh, scans every patient every hour. It finds a possible adverse drug event. When the pharmacist goes into the pharmacy program, uh, a little uh, pop-up will be there if I get the pointer to work here again. Sometimes the pointer's not working. Uh, anyway, that top line there, for example, where it says the time the patient receives diphenhydramine or doubling in creatinine, that will then pop up every time the pharmacist goes into just the regular uh, pharmacy program. So that way we and then we'll, uh, the pharmacist will have to then put in there Acknowledge whether he saw the alert and what he uh, or uh, she did about the alert. So it depends on what works best in the hospital. Um, that's the way we've been able to uh, change that over the number of years. Uh, Beth also talked about uh, smart pumps. Before we had, uh, we got uh, smart pumps here in 2009, about two years prior to that. We decided what we would uh, develop a smart EMR. As Beth time uh, talked about, 90% of the patients receive IV meds. Many, if not uh, most of those, come through the IV uh, pumps. Nurses program the pumps. They put in the dose and the rate of the uh, drug, and those pumps are used anywhere from you know 300, 400 pound uh, adults down to uh, premature in, uh, infants. They can program the pump to be 0 0.1 to 9,900 milliliter volumes over a, a wide uh, range of rates. They program milligrams per hour, milliliters per hour, micrograms per hour, micrograms per kilogram per uh, minute, units, and uh, on and on. So you can see the potential of error is quite high. Uh, reports out there uh, range anywhere from 35 to 65 percent of the adverse drug events are caused by uh, med errors and. A lot of those are uh, programming errors, uh, pump programming errors. So what we did, and what we still continue to do, with the uh, also with the uh, uh, smart pumps, and I can't get the pointer here to work, but you can see down in down in the bottom there, each of our pumps now, and fusion pumps we have uh, connected to the bedside computers. Uh, we develop what's called an RS232 to uh, USB connection there. So all the pumps connected to the bedside com computer, they go then go through the hospital network, and all the data then ends up going back to the EMR. Here we go. So the logic doesn't reside back here just on the pump. All our logic resides back here on the uh, EMR. So if a nurse programs a pump and they program with the computer uh, as an error, the computer picks that up right away. Now, all of us have probably dialed the tele phone, and as soon as we dialed that, we realized that we dialed the wrong number. So even though the uh, computer identifies that error right away, we wait, we give the nurse 30 seconds to identify that they did program that wrong. If they did not, every com uh, computer, every one of the bedsides, in the uh, nursing pods, in the conference rooms, we take and 
in control of all of those, and we'll put up their pump alert, give you what the room number is, and because a lot of our uh, patients may be on 12 or 13 different uh, pumps, we'll also tell you what the actual pump uh, number is. Not only do we do that, but pharmacists then get a page in an email uh, identifying what actually happened, and it gives our pharmacists the uh, capability then to uh, follow up on those. During the first 22 months, we turned this on in our uh, shock trauma intensive care area. We set up to monitor 23 of the most toxic drugs out there. Uh, during that period of time, over 31,000 doses of those 23 uh, meds were uh, given to the patient. 81% of those were actually via the uh, pump. During that period of time, we generated 970 alerts. That's 4% of the doses, or an average of 1.4 alerts per day. Uh, we found out that we prevented 130 uh, seven actual adverse drug events. Now the smart pumps, they will monitor the first time you program a uh, dose for that drug in there. We found out and what we also built in there that three quarters of our adverse drug events were not the first time that, that they got the drug, it was as they uh, tie, tie traded or, uh, rated the, or uh, changed the dose uh, actually up. All of these harm or potential harm were uh, due to programming errors. In every case but two of these, the nurse went back, picked up on the uh, alert, and changed the uh, actual dose. Um, so the bottom line is here, we are currently running now. We do have the smart pumps out there. We've had those since uh, 2009. So we got the smart pumps, and then we have this is running in, in the background also. Beth uh, talked about when, when the nurses are attempted to just uh, run the pumps in basic mode, that basically takes all the logic out of the uh, pump. In this case here, the nurses don't have to do anything. They just went to a pump, whether it's a uh, smart pump or not, and they don't have to uh, bypass anything. The other ad advantage is that we have the room number in. We have certain uh, cardiovascular drugs where the uh, uh, the coronary care unit has different uh, dosage logic than uh, other areas. We also have the uh, patient's age, gender, the glucose level, the blood uh, pressure, respiratory rate, renal function. The patient is also getting uh, calories through a TPN. Uh, we also have that uh, logic in there. The other advantage is uh, when the uh, smart pumps first came out, you had to physically uh, touch each of those to update the uh, actual logic. Now with the web-based or the, web -based or the uh, wireless pumps, you don't have to do that, but you uh, still have to go in and uh, change those. We can change the logic one place and all the hospitals out there automatically uh, come up. Also to keep uh, vein open alerts, uh, certain patients are on cardiac drugs or actings, uh, sedatives or whatever, blood pressure, different types of things. When those drugs run out, they're not picked up. We also generate an alert. So I guess the bottom line is here, not only do we have the smart pump, but we also have this uh, smart EMR that's also uh, monitoring the uh, patient's background. I think that's it for me. Marlene? Okay, thank you. Um, hit enter on the slide. Okay, thank you. The system intranet report. Just hit enter, please. Thank you. Okay, do it again a couple, three, two or three times here. These are just examples of um, adverse drug events, the web reports, system level, facility level, um, and then underneath that they get uh, specific detail. I think the power is that we can do the roll up, the drill down, the campus specific analysis. It gives us a lot of flexibility. <clears throat> Next slide. Um, outcome measures then that we're recommending are adverse drug events and reactions for the definition we discussed earlier, um, numerator being the numbers of met errors and reactions, and the denominator being patient days. It's a fairly standard um, denominator, and it's inpatients only. Next slide. Is adverse drug events related to harm? Uh, we use the NCC Merck categories so that we can break it out by the A through I. 
some systems may still use no injury, mild, moderate, and severe. And we do map the A through I categories to the mild, moderate, and severe categories as well. But we're recommending that we measure events and harm. Next slide. Um, some process measures that you could consider if you have these processes in place is the barcode override process and BTE prophylaxis um, compliance. That's a current core measure. It's already being collected. The data is available and is specific to the surgical population, and we do have that data as well. Next slide. Um, just a quick review. We've got like one minute here. So today we've talked about lots of different things you could do as far as an ADE program, things to do in terms of getting started, having structure, having education, having a monitoring system in place, and policies and procedures. I'm hoping that those of you on the phone can take away a couple of ideas from each for each of your organizations as well. And then you'll be receiving more information on submission of measures. Next slide. Okay, Amy, if you're in the room, will you want to just close us up here? Sure, you bet. Just as a reminder, the, um, the Intermountain Lead Hen offers a lot of resources. Most of them are found on our website or information are found on our website. Again, it's www.henlearner.org. Um, if you need subject matter expert help, if you need implementation advisors, please send us an email so that we can help get that information to you. Also, again, a reminder about our affinity group calls. And um, the tools are found on our website, kenlearner.org. Next slide. And I want to remind you about the affinity group calls and tell you specifically about the ADE. We'll be starting these at the end of the month. The first ADE call will be September 25th. It'll be 2 p.m. Mountain Time. Um, I'll let you do the math for your current location. Call-in information will always be found on our henlearner.org calendar. So check there. Um, we'll keep that up to date with the call-in information. And please send us questions, comments, ideas, suggestions at admin at henlearner.org so that we can make these calls something that's very valuable to you like we anticipate them being. Next slide, please. Um, a big thanks to the Intermountain Healthcare Medication Safety Team, Pharmacy Services, Anticoagulation Task Force, and guidance, or Pain Guidance Team, and a big thanks to our presenters. And um, enjoy the rest of your Monday. Thank you. Off. Sounds like it. Where do you want it to be in there?